So a very warm welcome to this session that's introducing the visual commentary on scripture. I'm Jonathan Evans, Associate Vicar for Heart Edge at St. Martin in the Fields. And this session is part of Living God's Future Now, the online festival of theology, ideas and practice from Heart Edge. Um, we'll say more about Heart Edge at the end of the session and my colleague Ben Sheridan will also post information in the chat as we go through. Um, we do want to invite you to post any questions or comments that you have in the chat as soon as they occur to you. And we'll pick those up at the end of the presentation for discussion with Ben Quash. Um, do also feel free to use the chat to discuss and share amongst yourselves. We'd ask you to remain muted until you're invited to speak, as that minimizes background noise for everyone else and um, uh, assists the, the quality of the recording. Um, so having said that, by way of notice, uh, notice it just remains for me to introduce um, Ben Quash. Ben came to King's College London as its first professor of Christianity and the Arts in 2007. He's someone who's fascinated by the many ways in which the arts can renew people's engagement with the Bible and Christian tradition, and uh, as such is directing the major seven-year project to create a, an online visual commentary on scripture uh, that he's going to introduce to us today. Among other roles and responsibilities, he runs an MA in Christianity and the Arts in association with the National Gallery. The visual commentary on scripture is the first uh, online project to attempt to introduce visitors to the entirety of the Christian scriptures in the company of art and artists. We're very grateful to Ben for joining us today to share some of the challenges and discoveries that he's encountered so far in this ambitious undertaking. Um, this is the first in a series of four sessions um, uh, covering um, uh, the VCS and its exhibitions. We'll be hearing in May from uh, three of the curators talking about their experience of curating in order to understand more deeply the value and potential uses to which these exhibitions can be put by churches. And we'll say more on that uh, again later. For now, though, it's uh, over to Ben. A very warm welcome to you, Ben. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, and thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks to Heart Edge. It's wonderful that Heart Edge exists, and um, I, I think that the, the things that this network is is doing are very important for the church. And I think the fact that one of the four the four C's that um, help to uh, help to shape Heart Edge's vision of its of itself. Um, the culture one in particular uh, are, are, are offer a real opportunity to think about the role of art, the arts in general, but maybe in, in the context of what I'm going to talk about today, especially the visual arts, um, in a creative way and in connection with, with the church's mission and how um, uh, the gospel and, um, and the ministry of the church can find uh can reach new people really partly through the help of of um of the visual arts and i think that's something that's very much a contemporary um kairos moment if that doesn't sound too overconfident um a statement because i think that what we are what we are experiencing together as a as a culture and it and this is something i think is globally true is um the rise of visual uh, visual images as in as a as a sort of lingua franca for um for communication between people across cultures continents and church traditions and indeed religious boundaries um not least through the platforms of social media in which people can share images very readily and very quickly and um and i think it's partly that that new lingua franca um, is creating a, a new set of circumstances for the church as well as for everybody else um, 
some of which have, I think, very important ecumenical implications, because I think that the, the church has often been divided about its relationship with the visual arts and um, Catholic and Orthodox traditions have had a sort of unbroken and continuous relationship with them, have used them constantly in, in the context of devotion, um, the furnishing of church buildings and so on. The, the more Protestant churches haven't, um, and that's a story we could go into, but I won't waste time on it right now. But because of the missiological imperative that often governs the more, perhaps more sort of evangelical wings of the church, um, the recognition that the gospel is to be proclaimed in all languages um, has to extend to the fact that, uh, that visual languages are a language in a certain sort of way. And that means that um, those churches, although they may have had historically a certain kind of suspicion of the visual arts, are now embracing them and, and trying to find out what possibilities they offer. So it's a, it's a new ecumenical moment as well. And um, part of the excitement for me in bringing together an interest in the visual arts and, and a love of scripture is to see how um, Christians of very, very different traditions can come together around that shared um project that's shared set of enthusiasms so that's a bit of background about why uh this seems a good time to do such a thing um some of you i know because i can see the participant list uh have heard me talk about the vcs before and it's very nice to see uh, some of my students amongst the group um uh, so I don't want to spend too long just explaining what it is. Um, if you want to find out what it is, you can go to the, the vcs.org, look around. I would suggest you go to the About the VCS section. There's a short video that describes uh, many of its key aspects. And, um, uh, and that will tell you a lot of the things that otherwise I would use up time doing now. Um, I will say just a couple of things, but then I, what I really want to do is get into a few selected exhibitions and to think um, as we look at, to think a bit about the different things that the VCS seems to be capable of doing and it's been a process for, um, for those of us who work on the team that's developing it, for the contributors or the curators as we call them who are writing for it and I think for its audiences using it um, to discover what, what it does do. We didn't know everything it, that it do before we started and um, you know one of the lovely things is that we had predicted some things and they turned out to be true um, but never would have predicted it out to be true but there may be some things we didn't that we predicted and haven't turned out to be true but um, I can't immediately think of them and it, it may be that that'll be a question that you ask and I'll have to try and think about that one but um, but generally speaking there's been an element of, of pleasant surprise about um, about what emerges from the process of bringing works of art together around scriptural texts. I'm going to share a couple of introductory slides from a PowerPoint, hopefully you can still hear me, um, is that the VCS is trying to create a context in which people can encounter the Bible company of art. Initially we said in the company of artists, um, and on reflection, I thought that wasn't quite right because um, that's to place, I think, more emphasis on the creators of the works of art and what they might have intended by them than on the works themselves. And the more we've worked on the project, the more I've become uh, convinced that, and this will be a big theme of what I'm going to say in the next half an hour or so, 40 minutes, is that the works are the crucial thing, that the, the artists may not have foreseen all the things that the works themselves might, might do and say to, to, their, to those who receive them, often over many centuries. And the works, if you like, have a life that goes beyond the artist's own intentions. When, when an artist makes a work of art, uh, the, the work is set afloat in a way and, and actually becomes things that would never have been envisaged by the artist because the people who receive the work see things in it, do things with it that the artist couldn't have anticipated, rather like we couldn't have anticipated uh, everything that the VCS might do. So 
agency, the agency of the creator isn't the only thing. And this isn't therefore only about encountering the Bible with the artists. In fact, more importantly, it's about encountering it with, with the works um, and finding out what things the works can do that continued to be generative and to um, slip the leash of any deliberate intention on the part of an artist. And that involves certain sort of um, outlook on the world and the way in which things that are there in the world, include, including cultural products, um, work together for good. It's a theological point of view, um, a theological uh, and hopeful outlook on the way in which works of art can be productive in ongoing situations, none of which are the same, exactly the same as those that have preceded them. Um, so that's part of what we're about. And that's why it's no longer artists, it's art. Um, and that might, that might unsettle some more traditional art, histori art historians, um, but uh, that's where we've got to. And uh, I'll be interested in your own reactions to that uh, when we have some time for discussion at the end. The company of art is huge. Um, we, one of the excitements and the challenges of creating this uh, online resource is that the quantity of art is overwhelmingly great. The, the number of possible choices uh, is so great that, um, that a lot of the time we, you know, we sort of feel, you know, almost embarrassed by the fact that our curators have to choose some and exclude others. Um, but at the same time, it's I think very important if if um, if I'm to try and to try and sort of characterise what the VCS is doing, it's very important to acknowledge that this is not a database of biblical art. Uh, such things do exist. Um, none of them is comprehensive. But if you want to, you can look at sort of huge uh, catalogues of. Um, medieval biblical art uh, organized by places like Princeton University and elsewhere and see you know all of the you know all of the enunciations you could ever imagine from a particular period of time or all of the mosaics of Old Testament subjects that you could ever imagine from whatever find you know there's a kind of there are projects that seek to do that database sort of thing and that's not what we're doing. We're actually much more interested in a more um, selective and distilled process where rather like writing a sonnet or even a haiku, the distillation, the, the, the tight format of selection um, involves decisions about the eloquence of particular works, especially when they're placed together with each other. Um, it's as it were, a belief in the way in, in which narrowing down or distilling can sometimes give you deeper insight than amassing a great plethora of possibilities. Um, and yet at the same time, the format of the VCS is that of three works always around a scriptural passage. And three is a really important number. So I've got lots of the kind of, um, sorry, I'll go keep that on for the moment, but you know, there are lots of there's a sense of the sort of multiplicity, the plethora in the slide that I'm showing you now, but each of the exhibitions, as you'll see in a minute, um, of the VCS uh, involves three works. And the, the number three has the advantage simultaneously of being a distillation or a reduction, and yet suggesting um, moreness, suggesting the possibility of uh, addition part and um, it leaves room for the to bring additional things to the table um, there's a there's a, a huge difference between two and three because two often involves direct compare and contrast um, a kind of sense that this is uh, question of choosing between one and, and the other, um, or just sort of seeing a spot the difference type of exercise that like you get on the back of a cereal packet. 
Whereas the moment you have three, you have a sense of multiple possibilities, um, which point towards even more than the three. But that gives the that gives the audience for the BCS the space to enter into an engagement with it, um, not telling them everything there is, but telling them enough in showing them three to suggest there's room for more. So it's meant to be a participative exercise to use the BCS. is meant to be um, to be invited into an ongoing conversation in which you make your own contribution uh, and that the the threeness kind of, kind of opens outwards rather than closing down inwards. So I hope that makes some kind of sense. And we have um, ancient inspirations for this, including the Jewish Talmud, which builds multiple comment, rabbinic commentary texts together around a central authoritative uh, text. Christians equivalent of that, which is called the Katina tradition, where uh, the biblical text has gathered around it uh, the insights of different theologians across time and the, the ancient Greek symposium which has as its basic format three couches the triclinium as it's called in Latin three couches around a central table on which conversation partners recline eat drink and converse in order to open up a topic a shared topic of interest um, and let it ramify outwards and the symposium model is also one of our key um, inspirations for for the threefold the choice of three works of art um, around a scriptural text and actually exhibits themselves in physical galleries which i certainly miss and look forward to getting back inside have a similar quality especially you know a small exhibition space like room one in the national gallery which is a single room one one wall is the entrance wall you come through the door on one wall of the room and then the other three might might in some cases only have a single work on each wall so that you've got an exhibition itself as a conversation between three works and again the curation of that the selection of three and the effect of that on a visitor is to involve them in the dialogue between the works uh, and make them a participant in meaning making, in creating the kind of the legacy of that exhibition, which in the end will be the sum of all of the res responses and all the receptions of all of those who did it. It will really be what the curator intended or envisaged at the beginning. A um, couple of final things that it's a theological enterprise. We want it to reach audiences of whom the church. The churches are uh, a crucial part, but also to reach um, art historians and museum educators who talk about this art and want maybe to find ways to help people understand what religious art might mean to religious people, not just as part of the story of art, but as the story of faith. Um, so we want to, as it were, show how works of art can speak to faith, even if those who might be exploring it in this way aren't people of faith. We want to kind of encourage them to imagine what it would be like to receive them in that way and use them in that way. And we also hope that we'll reach um, schools and, and universities and places where the Bible is taught, often perhaps not as excitingly as it could be. And we hope that um, inject art into the mix will will actually make it a little bit more exciting especially for those encountering it for the first time in schools um it's as i say each each passage of scripture is at the center of a curated mini ex it's ecumenical i said a bit about that at the beginning this what i feel is like is a new moment in terms of the importance of visual language for all of the churches including those who haven't had a strong visual tradition. We hope it will occasionally at least be um, a stimulus to epiphany. So a sort of dropping of the scales from the eyes in which a new insight of some personal importance or collective community importance might emerge as the biblical text is catalyzed by its interaction with visual art. 
And there's an example of the Talmudic page I was talking about earlier, where you can see in different colors and different um, sizes of margin, different sizes of font, you can see voices, effectively voices captured on this composite page, um, giving a visual representation of a living conversation, which all of those who study Talmud join in with. And that's what we hope will happen also with the BCS. That's the Christian equivalent, the Katina page. So those are things um, just to kind of set you up with a sense of what it is. And I thought now we could dive in to the site itself. So what I'll do is um, uh, the home page of the visual commentary. There you go. And um, and this is preparing for this talk has been a really uh, helpful um, prod to me to start thinking about things that I feel that differences have accomplished. You, from your various backgrounds, as I describe these, which I'll do in the next few minutes, will, I hope you'll see ways in which these might um, resource or, or, or have applications for you in the ways in which you introduce the Bible to your congregations, if you have them, or meditate on it uh, yourselves. Um, and, and in a way, part of what I'm going to explore is the way that different curators have worked in order to come up with their combinations, their juxtapositions of works of art in relation to particular texts. So the first group, um, the first type of connection that I'm going to uh, show you has to do with what I would call formal echoes. So it's where formal similarities between, that's to say, similarities of shape or color or composition actually um, help people to make connections between works when thinking about a text, a scriptural text. Um, and I thought given that uh, Jonathan is, is our host, I might begin at the risk of embarrassing him with one of his uh, exhibitions, which is from the book of Daniel and it describes Nebuchadnezzar. You can see here how many exhibitions we've got, by the way, this is scrolling through the books uh, of, of the Bible. And each of these has an exhibition now, some have several. Or well, actually, no, we have a few minor prophets who are still waiting. So I'm on the hunt for Daniel. And actually, I've skipped it by accident. There we go. So Jonathan's written this lovely exhibition called Back from the Brink about when Nebuchadnezzar uh, is expelled into the wilderness and, and becomes sort of animalistic, uh, enters a condition of, of degradation. Um, which in the end is redemptive for him. And that's a key theme of, of Jonathan's treatment of this. Um, uh, but what we have here, as you can see, is one more historical, William Blake's study of um, as a, in that uh, animal-like condition in the wilderness. And one more contemporary by the Australian artist, Arthur Boyd, Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the tree. And what we see in both of those, which those two, the Blake and the Boyd, which are direct responses to the biblical text, are you know, visualizations of the figure of Nebuchadnezzar. And, and Jonathan may want to speak to this himself, but what's really interesting about what he's done is he's discerned a parallel, which is in part a visual parallel between these two figures and his the figure in his third work which is by Scottish artist Peter Howson, who clawed his way back from alcoholism uh, through, with the help of Alco Alcoholics Anonymous. And some of the experience process, which was also for him a redemptive process, um, through his painting, 
And so what we see here is a figure who's visually speaking very similar in certain respects to the Nebuchadnezzar figures that we see in the other two works. But this is not directly a study of Daniel. So the connection has been made in another way. Um, the connection has gone on a different journey, if you like, than just through artists who treat the same text. It's gone through artists who might treat comparable experiences, human experiences, deep spiritual experiences. And as a result of that journey, which might look like a detour, these images find themselves talking to each other and productively. And I would say that the addition of the Peter Housen work um, adds a new dimension to the way in which we might now read the story of Nebuchadnezzar. We might now read it ends of Peter Housen's story and maybe other stories that we know um, that give the text a new dimension in context. So that, that's my first example. That's an example of how formal similarities, formal echo the works of our selves might um, play a part in the collection of these exhibitions and in the opening up of the scriptural texts. Um, and there are other ones that I might point to, so I won't spend as long on these, but in the, the New Testament, have a lovely uh, exhibition on the Epistle of James by one of my colleagues at King's, uh, Claire Carlyle, who found in trying to treat, sorry, James's um, discussion of the father of lights, one of the great phrases in uh, the first chapter of James, uh, the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow, with capacity for self-deceit, um, people who observe their face in a mirror and observe themselves and go away. Um, so the sense of a sort of idolatrous fixation on the self and, and the sense of what, what it would be to, as it were, break out of this condition of self-enclosure and enter a religion in verse 27 that is pure and undefiled before God. Um, and what, what Claire has done is find connections between three, three works of art um, that beautifully pick up the themes of the text through the formal, the very fundamental formal shape of the circle. So the father of lights, perfect and unchanging, uh, is explored through this very contemporary work called uh, Reflections. It's part of something called the Heliotrope series, which is which floats on a, a body of water and absorbs the light from the sun and reflects it back. So it's where the perfection of the circle is linked through this work to the fullness, the plenitude of the sun's rays, um, a classic image of, of the divine. Um, and so you have a sense of the kind of unchanging completeness of the divine light. Alongside Vajo's study of Narcissus, which if you look closely, you can see creates a circle and a circle of the helium. at least by the the arch above the implication that this will continue round and as it does so gather will gather into itself into the perf perfection of the divine circle where christ is already enthroned it will gather into it all of the all of the saints all the creatures who are who have been released from the closed circle of narcissus and are now able to be incorporated into the perfection of the divine, uh, the circle of the divine light. So all similarity, the circle becomes a way of reading James or as a, um, as a way of thinking about ourselves and the human condition. So that's my first 
sort of connection. The second is perhaps a bit rarer, but it's to do with the materials from which things are made. So we'll see New Testament and we'll go to perhaps not so not so well read a text, um, 1 Peter, although it is the, the big for uh, Ambeth Conference for all of the Anglican, um, all the members of the Anglican Communion who are who have their have had their uh, big gathering of bishops deferred by COVID, prepare for it by intensively reading one Peter, and this is that famous passage about living stones. Come to him, stone did, and then the 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 quotation about laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, um, and then must be built house so we become living stones and what's what's lovely about this exhibition is that um uh, anna kim who is its curator that all use stone in different ways or stone so michelangelo's final guitar um is sculpted from marble and finished but all almost certainly deliberately by the artist, it becomes a, a sort of um, a legacy in stone of Michelangelo's own sense of how he, wa he wanted his own genius in competition with, with, um, with the God whom he worshiped. In, in other words, you know, he, he was, he was, as with some other works, deliberately um, abandoning the search for his own self aggrandizing brilliance to be all that people read out of the work. He wanted instead to show, uh, display a certain acknowledgement of his own humility and openness to a perfection, even as the brilliant artist that he was. And so we get this, ex these exquisitely sculpted legs. And as always on the VCS already, every image is in high resolution. So every image can be zoomed um, and explored in real detail. So you have these exquisite remnants, if you like, of what he was capable of. And the, the kind of now, free hanging arm, which I'm just kind of tracking up. You can see the high resolution is still kicking in as I speak. Then cut off. And then the rough surface of the either unfinished sculpture or deconstructed sculpture, which shows at the same time Michelangelo acknowledging, as it were, a, a perfection great in his own art artistry. And rather like the stone rejected, which is Jesus in the passage from 1 Peter, um, this sculpture has, has emerged as one of the most treasured works of Western art, the most valued and the most loved, whilst at the time of Michelangelo's death, a sort of failure to some, or you know something he rejected. Uh, um, and there's a, there's a rather beautiful parallel, I think, between those two things, uh, which Anna Kim draws out. And then alongside that, a mosaic, one of the most uh, beautiful mosaics in one of the most important Byzantine churches, um, much of the Cora in Istanbul. And of course, mosaic, the tesserae of mosaics are glass or stone. So again, we have that theme of stone being glued. Stones themselves being made vehicles for the communication of God, which are a, a sort of reliquary from the sixth, the Palestine reliquary box, which are bits of wood from the Holy Land 
um, um, so from places like Our Supper, the site of the crucifixion, from Bethlehem, and set in this in in this box, as you can see, some of them labelled um, as a sort of tiny portable pilgrimage site, so that if you couldn't go there. Uh, physical elements of stone and wood make your own journey, as it were, through the life of Christ, through the Holy Land, through these stones. Episodes from the life of Christ are, are painted in miniature on the wooden lid of the box, which probably face. So, what we're seeing in these painted images is what would have when the box was closed, would have themselves almost kind of mapping the locations of Christ's life uh, onto the visual images that record Christ's life. Um, and so you get a sense of the, the transmission of the real historical, physical, bodily elements of transmitted through stones and then through paint and wood to to us, uh, maybe encourage us to think about how, as living stones, we are also to be transmitters, take our place in that sequence of the life and significance of Christ uh, onwards through history. So there the material of stone becomes the connection between the three works in, in the exhibition, and together they illuminate the biblical text. The third category is a motif. Uh, and in this case, this is perhaps a little bit more unusual. Um, I'm going to take you to part of the story of Elisha. And I hope I can find it now. Yes, here is a really interesting exhibition that picks up on the, the of a bedroom for, for Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 4. So he's got this demanding ministry. Um, he's miracle working, he's traveling a lot. He is through the creativity and the new life of God to many people. And the contribution of this woman to this is to create for him a bedroom. Um, and so she, she gives him a, a couch or a bed in her house. Uh, you can read it yourself. It's also the place where he heals her child, uh, again, on a bed, um, lying on his body and breathing into his mouth. Um, so it's a very powerful story. But this idea of the bedroom or the bed as a place of, of creativity and new life is drawn out by um, uh, Zhao Situ, the curator of this exhibition, by three very contemporary works that look at beds. So the poet Emily Dickinson's bedroom, she was notoriously reclusive and spent most of her time in this with a tiny writing desk that you can see there, writing her poems. Frida Kahlo, the painter who was very badly injured in a car accident uh, and um, had to convalesce for most of her, the rest of her life in, in all sorts of uncomfortable, you know, corsets and other supporting mechanisms. Um, and so effectively set up her bed as a studio space with a mirror above her. So portraits whilst in bed, an easel that she could paint on whilst in bed. As you can see around her, lots of books and things that she read for inspiration. She's part of the nap ministry. is a nap bishop of this nap ministry. She's part a kind of an intervention uh, that sits prophetically in the life 
and that's partly a comment on our contemporary Western culture of work, uh, the oppressive mechanisms of capitalism. It's also very particularly um, a reflection on how uh, those from black and minority, minority ethnic backgrounds are the most harmed by this culture. And what she cotton buds, which of course some of the ways in which um, most oppressively black slaves were put to work, black slaves were put to work. And so it make, there's an additional sharpness, if you like, to the prophetic critique involved in this, in this work. Um, and all of these relate back to this provision of a, a place to rest by the woman of Shunem. So um, what we have is, if you like, the motif of the bed connecting these three works and illuminating the text of scripture. Um, now I'm conscious I've been going for nearly three quarters of an hour and I have so much more I'd love to say. So let me just race quickly through a couple of for discussion. Um, there are ways in which the exhibitions have been able to elude differences between uh, synoptic parallel texts. Um, so for example, the, there are various examples I could point to here, including the woman with an issue of blood, which you can visit if you like um, in, in your own. We've had a recent exhibition on Peter's walking on the water. And I thought this was beautifully done by, it's by uh, Johannes Clausen, the head of the Culture Bureau of the German Evangelical Church. And what he did was he, he showed three images in the, um, on, sorry, on, the, on Matthew, Mark and John, not the three synoptic gospels, the three gospels that treat this episode in what they draw out of it. It's a message in which um, almost the resurrection has, has already happened, or that sense that the, the reassurance that comes with resurrection knowledge is already in play in the way that the, the episode is told. In a, in a chapel made um, and used by, uh, first of all, um, uh, what's the word, prisoners of war, and now used uh, as a place in which many refugees uh, arriving in Germany are placed as their applications for asylum get processed. Um, and so that message in the chapel of this former barracks is very powerful in that context. But he reads this as a Johannine, um, Johannine in spirit in its uh, exploration of, of the episode of uh, Peter walking on the water. And then we have the, at the opposite extreme, I'll jump over that one. Uh, this strange picture called The Drowning Dog by Goya. Um, it, end, it ended up looking like that because the painting itself has, has been damaged, but what's emerged from, from it is powerful in its own right. So we, we don't know why, only now this dog's head appears uh, above this rather darker brown area at the base of the painting. Um, but it, it, it looks as if it's swimming, struggling to swim, struggling to keep its head above water um, uh, in a sort of muddy, muddy deluge of some kind um, and so we're, we're, we're kind of given a new way to read it by the accidents of its um, uh, of its history as a as a painting and and Johannes Clausen this as much more in the spirit of the Marken account which is a far stronger element of fear you know, that Peter is actually scared and the disciples are scared and it's not even clear that Jesus is going to turn aside as he walks across the water because he seems initially to be going somewhere else and you can't count on the fact that he might 
turn aside and save the drowning figure. So the struggling of this dog becomes a, a sort of window onto the, the mark conversion. And then um, in this work painted for a, a, a fisherman's chapel on the North Sea, we see a kind of mixture of the two. So we see in the distance on the right, uh, a very serene and calm sea, an open sky, a clear full moon. And as you move across through Peter and the billowing cloak of Christ, who himself looks stable and unflapped, has this very flapped cloak. As you move left, you see huge waves, turbulent skies, a full sail and distressed disciples. And so the mixture of the more Jahanine serenity and the mark and fear uh, encapsulates something more like a, a Matthean um, vision, a Matthew-like vision. So what he's done is find three works that kind of bring out elements of the three different gospel accounts of this event, which I think is very interesting and helpful. You know, it gives you a way to read these scriptures. Um, some of our exhibitions can explore the history of interpretation of a particular text. If you look at the Witch of Endor, which shows how the idea of the witch is hugely transformed at different times in history and, and very early Christian images of the witch actually make her look a bit like Christ because she resurrects um, Samuel, uh, the ghost of Samuel, but she's depicted as it were almost like Christ raising Lazarus. So the negativity we might associate with some of the tradition of the woman of Endor um, is not there in the earliest images. And then in medieval and Reformation images, she's really, really Halloweenish, sort of Halloweenishly witchy, which shows the results of, as history unfolds, of a whole new kind of um, witch craze, paranoia. Um, and then her third work, perhaps controversially, is a tarot card of a sort of high priestess figure whose magic powers are again conceived in a more positive light in a uh, late 19th, early 20th century context where, which probably has, you know, important interconnections with the rise of um, a more feminist uh, outlook um, and, and, a, and a new sort of exploration of how the power of this woman in the ancient biblical text might have important things to say to encourage and empower modern women. So that's a good example of, if you like, the reception history of a biblical text being brought out through three works in the BCS. There are denominational differences. The ascension um, are much less likely to think of it as Jesus going away to an absent place. Um, and having to leave all, all his power and authority with Peter, the papal key holder, um, and more how heaven and earth remain together. So orthodox images of the ascension tend to have a more strong sense of heaven and earth, as it were, moving forward together in history, whereas Catholic ascensions tend to think of them as separating off heaven, as were Jesus disappearing into heaven, and, and, and the earth, the earthly church having to get on without him. So that's an interesting example of a different denominational difference. And then the last thing I want to show before we stop, because I think this is a really good preparation for the wonderful talks I know you're going to get um, in the next three from particular curators, are those works that, those uh, exhibitions that don't only show works that respond to the biblical text, but as it were, create a present challenge to us that they see as in continuity with the, the challenges of the biblical text in its own time and since. So um, a good example of this is one by somebody called Eric Smith, who's a biblical scholar in America on one Timothy. And it's on slavery. And 
he's chosen three works, I think, of immense power that also reflect on economic disparities in modern society, just as 1 Timothy is reflecting on the effects of economic disparity in, in the time of the New Testament. Asian. He was a slave photograph of Virginia. This painting by actually Diego Rivera's husband, which shows the modern city, but also the subtext, the subterranean underpinnings of the modern city, which includes incredible poverty. So the vast numbers of the homeless sleeping in this tier of the city's life below street level, as you can see um, in the middle section. Yeah, then beneath that, a, a vault in which the moon stored, a huge safe in the middle guarded by a guard who faces us, but echoes the guard who faces away from us as he monitors uh, all of these bodies of, of the victims of the system. Um, and so the deepest vault is if the money that's stored that's generated off the backs of the suffering of the men accumulated for the benefit of the few whose spills are the superficially visible part of this three-tier arrangement. It's a bit like, there's a sort of Dante-esque three triple-decker universe here, but played within a new way. So a very contemporary challenge to us in which a biblical text from the past proves its relevance to the present through a work of art that's very contemporary, relatively speaking, and speaks directly to us now and asks us, what are we going to do about situations, context, and people who are as much the people the Bible was talking about then as they are now? So I'll stop there because I, I've gone a bit over, but thanks very much for listening. And uh, I'll stop the screen share, but we can always go back and look at things if you'd like. Okay, hey, tremendous. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, uh, apologies for the uh, uh, internet connection um, and the breaking up. So I should apologize for that, sorry. That's uh, all right, but I think we've, we've caught the majority of um, what you've had to say um, and um, very helpfully share. Um, so there are a, a few comments and questions in the chat and then we can see whether there are other things that people would like to ask. Um, one or two people um, uh, joined early on and ha had to leave. Uh, the Halliwells left a, uh, a question right at the beginning when you were talking about the varying ways in which the work can be interpreted and um, those perhaps differing from the original inspiration of the artists themselves. And they were saying, is there an analogy with preaching in that the preacher does not control how their words are received um, by the congregation? Um, would you see an analogy there, Ben? Yes. Very much. Not not all preachers would would appreciate this, um, but uh, I absolutely think that's the case. And the um, the familiar experience of anyone who preaches is that that you know people will come up to you at the end and say, "I'm so grateful for what you said." You know that that really struck home uh, because, and then if you, then they they give the reason it wasn't actually what you meant at all. <laughs> but but I you know at the risk of um, uh, I think a, a false complacency about that. I think the the, the way in which the spirit speaks through um, through what one says is more important than what necessarily what one intended. So some of those receptions of the spoken word will bear fruit not because of what you thought you were saying and i think the same is true i think of, of, of art so um 
but it can of course have a negative side that and trying to make yourself clear in a sermon isn't a bad thing i'm not saying that but um but also being ready to accept that sometimes there might have been more in what you said than you thought there was or something different than what you thought uh maybe also a salutary reminder that you don't control um the receptions of of things and actually that the meaning is made in in the in the space between the manufacture and the reception of the reception thank you um kate had wondered if the methodist art collection had been accessed um in curation uh, at all uh, i love the methodist art collection and we work um closely with them. Well, at the moment there are any works from it um and that is something i would need to check um and i can't answer straight off sorry about that i i think so um and certainly in in britain of uh of art that relates to the bible and to christian subjects um it's an absolutely fantastic collection so um so i think there is but i'm afraid you've put me on the spot because i i would need to be able to go and just uh, check where everything came from uh, or ask my team who aren't here sorry yeah no worries no worries um we'll come to those that have got hands i think there's in. sorry I, check, oh, you found I check the, the feeding of the five thousand No, I think we might have a feeding of the 5,000, but um, with fish. But uh, I, I need to check. Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, so we've got Catherine Juice next. Uh, Kath, um, uh, do you want to unmute and just ask your question? Yes, so, uh, thank you ever so much, Ben, for, for your talk. It's really interesting. Um, I've got a question about, and sorry if I've missed it in your explanation at the beginning, is the process by which you've collected the works of art to go into the project um, and the global reach of that. Um, is, it pe is it people on your team who have identified interesting projects you've now joined or, or do you take recommendations? Because um, I was reminded of a time in my life about four or five years ago when I was, um, I used some wonderful woodcuts um, from a trans, um, woodcuts of the book of Ruth, reading Ruth, who are you, my daughter, reading Ruth through image and text. Um, so he, the Old Testament scholar at Duke uh, Divinity School, Ellen Davis, has done a lovely sort of translation of the book of Ruth and, and, and I've sort of seen it being used in, in Sudan and Solomon Islands and, and it's very, very interesting to encourage participatory interpretation of the text in a completely new way. All the things that you were touching upon and so I got very excited about that memory and and about the perhaps the, the extended global reach that this project might have to support theological colleges around the world and so on. Thank you, Catherine. Yes, the, um, the selection of works of art is principally done by our curators themselves. So we, we invite them to choose. Um, but we offer them help if they want it. So, um, so quite a lot of the time, the non-art historians or those not, not necessarily so familiar with visual art will ask for suggestions and we'll throw ideas at them. Um, and what's been the case, particularly in the last, I would say 18 months or so, for us, what's been a priority has been to try and widen much beyond the kind of Western canon, so to speak, of art. The trouble with a Google search is that we'll bring to the surface West, mainly Western art in, in Western art museums. And, uh, and people then just by default tend to go for those. Um, so what certainly the, the, the exhibitions that um, have become to appear in the last 12 months or so are much glo globally diverse. 
Am I breaking up? I'm really worried I'm breaking up now. Can you hear me? We can, we can still make out the majority. About, yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah. I'm really sorry. Um, so there, were, there are many more works now from non-European, non-North American sources. Uh, but we want doing that. The practical problem is that they're very difficult to get hold of sometimes or even find um, because they're not necessarily in museums. They're not necessarily photographed in high resolution. And finding out how to get the rights to use them is can take can take 10 times longer than a work that's in a museum. So that there are real challenges about it, which you know we have to do a sort of balance of costs really. Um, so th there's we've we've had somebody who's written using three works of Indonesian art, one of which is in a remote part of Indonesia, and we could send a photographer to take a photograph of it, um, but that that's a huge cost, and um, and there was a, an Ethiopian work where the person who owned the rights to it, no one knew if he was even alive because he lived in isolation in a mountain region. And so again, we had real challenges with that. So, so there are kind of practical logistical challenges, but our, 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 one of our top priorities is to diversify the art and the contributors so that we don't just have academics or art historians from uh, Europe and North America encouraging thank you we're doing our best that's great so we're going to go to Catherine Farnham Dia next and then to Delvin and then to anyone else uh, who has a question or a comment hi there um just to answer a previous question I did notice with the Lent um course that there was a picture from the Methodist modern art collection included in that um so thank the you. crucified tree form which was lovely um, but my question was um, about your emphasis on the work of art rather than the artist and whether that meant that you never considered the private life of the artist when putting together your exhibitions. I noticed there was a Caravaggio, for example, I think he was a murderer, but we still look at his pictures. And is this ever a problem? Uh, that's a huge question. Thank you for it. But, um... It's not, it's not been the case so far that we've had to exclude a work on the grounds of um, the kind of uh, uh, private life of the or biography of the artist. Um, I mean, perhaps another pertinent example would be Eric Gill. As it happens, we don't have any Gill at the moment, interestingly. Um, I think even then we would be we would be unlikely to say no um, on the grounds that the work's use and reception has um, has um, kind of uh, exceeded the the artists whatever particular failings the artist's um, life might have. So there's that sense in which um, the, I suppose, you know, the, uh, well, I, this is perhaps sidestepping it a bit, but we've just had two, two of the most recent exhibitions are on Judas. And interestingly, both of the curators of those Judas exhibitions have wanted to emphasize that even this betrayal, um, this most, in some ways, most heinous of crimes or sins, um, has has had fruit, has borne fruit in ways that require us, you know, never to write him off in in an eschatological perspective. You know that there is no redemption. And that, so in an odd way, the, the artistic legacy of Judas might be a life-giving one for those who relate to it afterwards, which is not to exonerate him, but to 
to think that there are there may be things that God can do with this legacy that that may well be more than we mm -hmm. would initially imagine. So maybe the same can be said about some of these artists. Um, I absolutely love Caravaggio, I have to say, and I think part of the brilliance of his art is that he was so he was so complicated and this this actually gave him the resources he needed to see into parts of human experience that other people didn't look into because he'd kind of gone there um so by choosing the works made by these artists we're not we're not um lionizing them we're not saying they're saints um and but we're we're approaching their work in the hope that you know it can do something if chosen discerningly you know, it can do something more than than they they knew i suppose yeah it's a great Thank question you. a hard question we'll go to delvin next thanks hey there ben uh, hi delvin i owe you an email i'm really sorry <laughs> i'm really excited you know and um and hearing your event uh hearing your uh, your talk about this project today has filled me with questions and, and uh, which, so even a longer email will come. But um, <laughs> first of all, we, we musicians have our own problems like Jez Waldo, the uh, uh, Baroque composer who was a murderer as well, wrote a lot of sacred music and of course Wagner. Um, so that's a, that was a great answer to that question. Um, but one of my questions is, have you, now I was in the car on my way to work. So I, I missed about, about 10 minutes of this in between when I was walking, but have you made? Have you thought about this resource as something that could be used in a sort of a heuristic way by communities of faith, like a resource where people could sort of do this on their own, uh, rather than or in addition to visiting the site and reading the commentary? And if so, what have been some of the challenges about that kind of work? Or if not, why not? I sort of. Thank you. Do you do you mean when you say use it on their own? Do you mean? make their own exhibitions or well i was just thinking about how and and, and the analogy to what actually some of the stuff i've done with saint martin's and hard edge right has been sort of creating events where people listen to music and talk about how it interprets the text the biblical yeah. text you know and so it's it's less a presentation and yeah. more opportunity um yeah. and i wonder if that's part of your project or how you think about the so that kind of usefulness in the church in yeah that definition of usefulness let's say again heuristically you know yeah yeah Okay, thanks. Well, we, we're very keen on that, um, exploring ways to do that. So we, we have a themes section, um, and part of the idea of that was that we'd be able to, that people who, uh, it's a bit like this, I don't know whether this pushes good or bad buttons for people, but I mean, it's a bit like the Gideon Bible where you know it says at the back if you're feeling depressed here are some verses you could read uh or celebratory or whatever um so but we were thinking more when we devised these that these were things that somebody in a church group or even as an individual might choose to explore you can see there some of them um so suffering or miracles or something like that. And then we would suggest to them um, a variety of exhibitions that speak to that theme. And they could meditate on it, explore what a particular situation they might find themselves in, in dialogue with texts and works of art that's, that, are, uh, that speak to that. So that, that's one of the things we've done. And then in a, in a rather more specific way, as some of you will know, we've created um, study packs for uh, for both Advent and and Lent, which either individuals or church groups could use together. In which we'd introduce one exhibition a week during Advent or Lent, and a group would meet and and reflect together on the works. Um, and we we created questions to accompany the, the exhibitions which were specially um, uh, aimed at helping a, a church group to, to ask, ask and explore questions that, that might relate to them and their journey. 
so some of the commentaries are you know most of the most of the people who write for the VCS are coming out of academic disciplines and some of the commentaries are more academic than devotional but part of what we're doing with these extra resources is trying to as it were give a devotional way of using them so that even if a biblical scholar has written quite a lot about the Greek or something about you know the detail of the text or an art historian has written quite a lot about the circumstances of the production of a work we take their curated ensemble of works and say and now we want you to ask these questions about them or we invite you to ask these questions about them and think about how they relate to your own exploration of faith and uh, your life in in the church so it's something we 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 intend to keep on doing and um and that will be part of our provision for that part of what we hope will be one of our ongoing main groups of users church people and then we might do similar things with people who are involved in art education but they would be different so we might say how would you introduce this to children here are some ways to do it use this exhibition why don't you ask them what they think about this detail and so on so the idea is to kind of create bespoke um I suppose put, to put frames around parts of the VCS that enable them to be used by the different communities that we hope will use it. Just to follow up, is it true, did I see somewhere that you're actually, you have done like museum tours where you actually sort of sort of do this live or was I, am I imagining that or? Uh, is that gonna be not online? specifically yet with the VCS. Um, although actually watch this space. So, we have um, three or four museums that we're working with on um, building a, a sort of VCS approach to their collections. Uh, we've worked most closely with the National Gallery, but um, but there are some other museums that are very interested in having a kind of, if you came to their museum and you are a VCS type person, uh, you wanted to explore their collection in a VCS type way, what would you go and see? What would help you to see it in, 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 a, in a way that takes its religious elements seriously? And then we'd try and provide that and the museums would offer it to people. So that, that's, that's a very much a live possibility at the moment, which we're quite excited about. And I think there are some churches that have used the VCS exhibitions for Lent courses or Advent courses as well. Um, do you have feedback about how they've done that and how that's worked? Yes, yeah, so we created these resource packs. We, we, we initially piloted it in Advent. We, we asked five, five congregations, different, different sorts of uh, church traditions to try out an Advent course. That was an experiment, um, which went very well. And then we offered a Lent pack a Lent course pack based around six VCS exhibitions, uh, one for each week of Lent, mm. and uh, about a hundred churches used that this Lent, um, and we had really helpful and positive feedback. So, um, and and alongside those those courses, we also offered a sort of daily reading program for individuals. So, yeah. some of you will have known that you could you could get you could get a work of art a day each week or a video, a short video on Monday, an individual work of art, Monday, Tuesday, sorry, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then what we call a comparative commentary that relates the three on a Friday. So each week had a, an exhibition structuring it all the way through Lent. And um, yeah, we, that, was, that was encouraging the response to that. So we, we will offer that again. And if you, if you are, at all interested in one of those in knowing about those resources and if you're not already on our mailing list you can just go to uh, go to the bottom of the page VCS homepage and sign up for the newsletter it, we try not to bombard people with stuff they don't want um, it's there just to let you know when we're offering something that you might be interested in and um, so do if you're not already do sign up for that and and the next time we offer a church 
resource pack of some kind, uh, you, you'll know about it. Right. Um, thanks, Ben. Um, Kate's got a question about further development. Um, do you want to unmute Kate and um, share that? Hi, um, thank you very much, Ben, for this afternoon. It's marvellous. Um, my question is, um, I've read somewhere that a mention of seven years, um, I'm not sure what that pertained to, if you could explain. And do you see that the exhibition um, evolving over time? Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Yes, the seven years was, um, it's a good biblical number, isn't it? <laughs> uh, se seven years of lean, seven lean years. The aim uh, to have covered the, the canon scripture in seven years. Um, I think realistically that's unlikely. Um, so we launched in 2018 and um, uh, but we'd already worked on it for two years before we launched it. So initially the endpoint was 2023. I think probably we'll be going uh, at least at least two years beyond that so I think it might be more realistic to think in terms of 2025 and I, I think also it may, it may what we the some um to make sure that available people we okay I know why you okay so I think we've lost um Ben again haven't we um so um I think this is probably the point at which we better uh wrap up if I could ask um R Ben to um, drop the uh, remaining text into the chat. Um, ben, we lost you again, um, but you have been very really sorry. No worries. Um, so I think uh, we're probably at the point where we we're probably best to to wrap up. I think, um, given the uh, the internet connection difficulties. Um, and I think we've picked up on most of the questions that um, uh, people have posted. Um, so um, huge thanks um, to Ben uh, for all that he shared um, about the VCS and um, uh, for introducing those whom it's a new resource. Um, and for those of us that know it um, reasonably well for giving us a sense of the um, the huge depth that there is within it. Um, as we've mentioned, uh, this is the first in a series um, where we're going to be hearing from uh, curators of some of the exhibitions. Um, so Ben uh, has dropped that information into the chat. So the next session in the series is on the 11th of May, again at two o'clock, and we'll be hearing from Deborah Lua. Um, talking about her experience of curating an exhibition on Proverbs 11 and um, opening up the theme of uh, the righteousness of true and accurate measures. Um, and then in the same week on Thursday the 13th, we'll be hearing from Caleb Frolich, who has um, been able to join us today, um, talking about uh, his Cities of Refuge exhibition and uh, the way in which that explores the provisions of the biblical Cities of Refuge from the perspective of sanctuary seekers. And then the last in the series is on Tuesday the 25th of May 
um, when Susanna Snyder will talk about her experience of curating an exhibition on Ruth chapters three and four, uh, which will focus particularly on issues of refugees and migration. Um, so do join us um, for each of these. Uh, they do all have their own sign up page on Eventbrite. Um, so do register for that, although the probability is that we're using the same Zoom link um, for all of them. But just to be on the safe side, do uh, register at the links that are in the chat. Um, there is uh, uh, plenty more uh, coming up in our Heart Edge Living God's Future Now um, series, um, uh, including a number of um, other events uh, on the visual arts. Um, so on Sunday, I'm beginning a new series of what we call Inspired to Follow, uh, which takes paintings from the National Gallery's collection and um, uses them to explore uh, Bible passages. Um, we also have, uh, in a week's time, an interview with the artist Jake Lever, um, and uh, Jake will be interviewed by Paula Gooder from uh, St Paul's Cathedral. Um, uh, but there are other uh, really interesting events coming up, including sessions on public health and church engagement with Gillian Strain. Um, so do, um, do check all those out and you'll be very welcome to join us uh, for anything further. Um, huge thanks to Ben. Um, anything that you want to say by way of wrapping up, Ben? Uh, just thank you very much for having me. Thanks for being patient with uh, that. And uh, no, it's been a real pleasure. And thanks for great questions too. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, do uh, come back for the later sessions in this series. Look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you.